The European Space Agency's automated transfer vehicle has a crucial role in maintaining human spaceflight operations on the International Space Station, humanity's permanent outpost in space. Each ATV is named after a scientist or individual who fundamentally changed the way in which we understand the universe. And this series of films aims to examine these scientific breakthroughs and visionary concepts that made history. Of all the theories proposed by astronomers to try and explain the observed features of our universe, none has captured the imagination more than the Big Bang. This model has transformed our understanding of the cosmos and the origins of space and time. And the father of the Big Bang was the Belgian astronomer Georges Lemaitre. Born in 1894 in Charleroi, Belgium, Lemaitre served as an artillery officer in the Belgian army during World War I and subsequently trained as both a priest and a physicist. It was Lemaitre's creative genius and vision that rewrote our understanding of the universe in a single theory that could explain phenomena observed beyond our own Milky Way. Phenomena which, in the early decades of the 20th century, were perplexing those astronomers who were struggling to understand both the scale and the history of the cosmos. For hundreds of years, observers had noticed seemingly cloudy regions of the night sky, nebulae. As the quality of visual, telescopic and photographic data improved, more and more details were resolved. Many of these nebulae seemed to show some type of spiral structure and, as is so often the case in science, two completely opposite explanations emerged as to their nature. To some, these clouds of dust and gas were thought to be relatively small phenomena located within our own Milky Way galaxy which, at the time, was assumed to be the extent of the whole cosmos. To others, however, the spiral nebulae were island universes, separate, vast collections of billions of stars like our own galaxy, but at enormous distances beyond it. How could astronomers choose between these two wildly different explanations? The key to understanding the nature of these nebulae is the technique of spectroscopy, based on the science of atomic physics. Every element in the universe is made up of atoms which consist of a central, positively charged nucleus, made up of protons and neutrons, and a corresponding number of negatively charged electrons orbiting around the nucleus. These electrons occupy a series of energy levels with the specific energies being unique to a given element. Electrons can change energy levels within an atom, but they can only do so by gaining or losing energy. And this can happen when the electrons interact with photons, bundles of electromagnetic energy that make up what we think of as light. We can see that if an electron absorbs a photon with the correct energy, it will jump to a higher energy level. If, however, an electron which has previously been excited to a higher energy level drops to a lower available energy level, it will emit a photon which has an energy equal to the difference between those two electron energy levels. Either way, all of the possible energies 
and therefore the wavelengths of the photons emitted and absorbed by a given element are specific to that particular element. Spectroscopy is the technique using this principle by which we can use light from a source we observe to identify which chemical elements are present in the source. By splitting the received light into a rainbow or spectrum, we can break down that light into a sequence of individual wavelengths. Because of the possible energies allowed by absorption and emission processes for a given element, we will see either characteristic dark lines at wavelengths where high numbers of photons are being absorbed, or characteristic bright lines where high numbers of photons are being emitted. And these lines will be at specific positions in the spectrum. Each element has its own unique pattern of spectral lines, its own electromagnetic optical fingerprint. Now, if we compare the light being emitted by a star or a galaxy with reference light produced by different elements here in laboratories on Earth, we can match the patterns of the different features at different wavelengths and determine the chemical composition of objects in space. It's the astronomical equivalent of using fingerprint matches at a crime scene. But the potential of spectroscopy extends beyond just identifying the chemical composition of planets or stars or galaxies. In 1912, spectroscopic measurements of many of the spiral nebulae showed a redshift, a shift in the position of their characteristic spectral features caused by a stretching of their wavelengths. This observation suggested that the spiral nebulae were actually receding from us, getting further away from Earth. And measurements of the amounts of redshift could be used to determine their velocities of recession. As more observations were conducted on other spiral nebulae, further patterns of redshift were observed. It was as if we were located at the centre of an enormous expansion, with the nebulae flying apart in all directions. In parallel, observations of variable stars within the nebulae, coupled with the use of telescopes large enough to resolve individual stars within them, confirmed that they were, in fact, hundreds or even thousands of times more distant than the stars within the Milky Way, strongly suggesting that they were entirely separate galaxies, other island universes. How could these observations be interpreted? What could be causing all galaxies to be receding from us? Evidence was presented during the great 1920s debates on the nature of these measured redshifts, but it was Lemaitre's analysis, coupled with his familiarity with the general relativity theory of Einstein, that led him to a startling conclusion, one which would shatter the generally accepted notion that the universe was in a steady state, forever unchanging on cosmological scales. In 1927, he proposed that the only model which could explain these observations in the light of general relativity was that the entire universe was born from a single origin which he called the primeval atom. An explosive disruption of this origin sent material flying out in all directions. And it was from this material that the galaxies subsequently condensed. This model could explain the measured redshifts. From a single event in the distant past, the entire cosmos was born. Let's cover this sphere with small dots, 
each representing an individual galaxy. This, by the way, can be easily demonstrated with a balloon. If we now inflate the sphere, the separations between the galactic dots increase. And, from the perspective of any individual dot, all of the other dots are getting further away from it. It's as if that particular dot was the center of the expansion. In this way, we can see how, from the perspective of each individual galaxy, this expansion would make it seem that every other galaxy was moving further away from it. In 1929, the American astronomer Edwin Hubble, building on the observations conducted by Vesto Slipher nearly two decades earlier, experimentally measured the redshift of nearly 50 galaxies and, plotting the velocities of the galaxies against their distance, discovered a pattern that emerged from the data, just as predicted by Lemaitre. The further away the galaxies were, the faster they were receding. But also, the relation between their distances and recession velocities was linear. And the constant of proportionality, now known as Hubble's constant, would, in principle, enable the age of the universe to be determined by simply reciprocating the constant. It would take nearly a decade before Lemaitre's ideas were generally accepted by cosmologists. Einstein graciously declared in 1933 that Lemaitre's theory was the most beautiful and satisfactory explanation of creation to which I've ever listened. But the renaming of Lemaitre's theory as the Big Bang came later still by the British astronomer Sir Fred Hoyle in a radio interview in 1949. Lemaitre's final vindication came 15 years later with the fortuitous discovery in 1964 by Arno Penzias and Robert Wilson of the cosmic microwave background radiation in which the entire universe is immersed. This is the final afterglow from the creation of the cosmos, now accepted to have occurred 13.7 billion years ago. This image shows the highest resolution map we currently have of the variations in the cosmic microwave background. It's a record of the time when the universe was only 380,000 years old. But, as is so often the case in science, as one mystery is solved, a new one emerges. Three decades after the discovery of the cosmic microwave background radiation, analysis of light from very high redshift galaxies, some of the furthest in the universe, seemed to suggest that rather than slowing down, as might be expected, due to the mutual gravitational attraction between galaxies, the expansion of the universe is actually accelerating. A host of subsequent observations since 1998 have further confirmed that some mysterious force is driving apart the universe's constituents, and perhaps the structure of space-time itself. Given the name dark energy, this driving force is thought to make up nearly three quarters of the mass energy content of the universe. And, although there are many theories, no one has any firm idea as to what dark energy actually is. Is it a fifth fundamental force of nature, called quintessence? Or perhaps a manifestation of Einstein's long-abandoned cosmological constant? Explaining the dark energy enigma is one of the biggest challenges in modern cosmology. And its resolution will be in the hands of the next generation of scientists, 
whose genius and vision will transform our understanding of the evolution of the cosmos once again. So great was Georges Lemaitre's redefinition of our understanding about the boundaries, origin and possible future of the universe that ESA, the European Space Agency, named its fifth automated transfer vehicle, or ATV, after this visionary of cosmology. ATV has boosted Europe's experience in sustaining operations on humanity's orbiting science laboratory, the International Space Station, or ISS. ATVs have brought thousands of kilograms of water, oxygen, propellant and experimental supplies to sustain both life and science operations for multinational crews. ATV has been an essential contribution to the success of the ISS and with a future role for ATV's derivatives as the European service module of the spacecraft that will take humans beyond Earth orbit, perhaps the ultimate legacy of ESA's ATV program will be its contribution to the extending of the human race's frontiers, to destinations including the Moon, near-Earth asteroids, and perhaps ultimately even the planet Mars.